Thank you. Uh, never change. This was a compliment someone who was sort of quite close to me once gave me. Uh, they loved me so much that actually they were quite happy with the way I was. It was a very comforting thing to hear, right? Uh, so change can be uncomfortable. Uh, and it can be uncomfortable for us personally. Uh, it can certainly be uncomfortable for the people around us. And arguably, change can be uncomfortable at a society level as well, right? Uh, however, amidst that discomfort is the undeniable truth that change is necessary. And indeed, I feel today actually change is imperative, particularly for you lot. If you could move on to the next slide, please. If we remain unchanged, uh, I think we are heading in the direction where there could be widespread starvation. Yes, you heard me right. Widespread starvation. Now you're thinking, uh, why is this guy being so sensationalist? Why is he being so provocative? Actually, unfortunately, it is a reality. And the first step in trying to fix it is for us to actually accept it so that together uh, we can create solutions to this problem. Because actually, this is not a problem that one individual or one organization can actually solve. Uh, in order to solve this problem, we need to actually change our mindset. We need, the cha we need to change the way we approach uh, how food is produced today and how agricultural practices are carried out. If you could move to the next slide, please. Uh, allow me to explain. So, by 2050, there's sort of global consensus that we'll be a population of 10 billion people. As of today, uh, we are 8 billion. Around 1 billion people today are already facing severe food insecurity. What does that mean? What is severe food insecurity? It means that actually they go entire days without eating. Now, if truly the world will be 10 billion people by 2050 in about 30 years' time, how, how are we going to feed everyone? The simple formula is actually, in order to feed everyone, uh, we need to produce 100% more food. And that's if we feed everyone and leave nobody hungry. 60% more food is required if we feed all sort of new people in the population, but the people who are hungry today remain hungry 30 years from now. So the same proportion of people actually remain hungry. So effectively, we have to double our food production in 30 years. So you might be thinking, okay, what's the big deal? Let's just produce more food, right? We're doing it today. We've got 30 years, surely with the technological advances in, you know, that we have access to, why can't we simply just do that? Well, unfortunately, that doesn't solve the problem. Producing food at that scale requires a lot of agricultural land. Uh, producing 100% more food in 30 years will require, in fact, eight times the land mass of Pakistan in additional agricultural land. Now, I'd like to put this a little bit into perspective and slow things down here as well because I really want this message to come across. That is the size of Australia. It's twice the size of India. It's the combined area of Saudi Arabia, Indonesia, and Mexico. That type of agricultural land doesn't exist in the world today, right? Now, let's assume by some miracle, we're able to find this land, right? That should solve our problem, right? We've got all this extra land. We're going to grow food on it. Let's say 30 years is enough time for us to cultivate it. And by the time we hit 10 billion people, there's enough food for everyone, right? Problem solved. Fantastic. Unfortunately not. That doesn't solve the problem either. And the fundamental reason for that is that agriculture is a massive contributor to climate change, to greenhouse gas emissions. As of today, 25% of greenhouse gas emissions in the world 
originate because of agricultural activity. The amount of food that we need to produce to actually feed everyone by 2050 would create four times the greenhouse gas emissions than to keep the world or to keep global warming at two degrees Celsius. Now, why is two degrees Celsius significant? So there's, it's, a, it's a globally accepted, you could say, ceiling for the amount of warming that can take place. People call it the tipping point, right? The Paris Agreement, which 129 countries signed in 2015, recognizes two degrees Celsius as the threshold. What happens when we cross that threshold or tipping point? Actually, uh, it's not a pretty scenario. Global consensus is that actually the world starts to become uninhabitable, right? Um, I think I quote the UN and uh, according to them, breaching the threshold will cause unending suffering, right? So where are we at? We've got to feed 10 billion people. We can't do that by growing more food the way we do today, because if we do that, guess what? We're going to end up destroying the world. We're going to end up destroying our planet. So the way we approach the production of food and agriculture has to change. There is, we don't have a choice, right? And that is really what I want to focus a little bit more time on today. If you could move to the next slide, please. Now, uh, unfortunately, this problem is actually amplified in Pakistan. Today, there are 8.6 million Pakistanis who face severe food insecurity. Again, I want to remind you guys what that means. That means they run out of food. It means they go hungry. It means they go without eating for days. 8.6 million Pakistanis. To put this into perspective again, that's almost the entire population of the UAE. It's almost the entire population of Switzerland. Entire countries worth of people. Now, this is happening in Pakistan despite us actually being an agricultural country. Our tradition of agriculture goes back thousands of years. One could argue, actually, that agriculture started in the Indus Valley, and quite successfully so, right? It's a, it's a fair argument to make. Uh, and honestly, if you ask me, I think agriculture is Pakistan's unfair advantage in the world. We have sun. We have fertile lands. We have one of the largest irrigation networks in the world, thanks to the British, right? Uh, despite that, we are unable to meet even our own food requirements. Uh, and it's pretty evident. I mean, if you look at the world map, Pakistan is represented as a sort of, you know, green segment, if you like, on the world map. So. We are an agricultural country, but we still have 8.6 million people who face hunger. And the reason for that predominantly is that actually our agricultural productivity is really poor. Okay, so doom and gloom, right? Sorry. Doom and gloom story, uh, but actually there is a silver lining, right? There's solutions to this, and uh, I feel that actually Leveraging of technology, using technical, uh, you know, expertise, in particular artificial intelligence, is a great way to try to address this problem. Uh, AI today, I think, has already entered the mainstream. Uh, ChatGPT is a great example of this, right? I'm sure all of you guys have tried it. Uh, other consumer-facing software, headline-grabbing software, has actually made proliferated AI into the mainstream. Look, using AI, we can actually operate very complex cultivation systems at a macro scale. 
using satellite imagery, using meteorological information, using sensor data, uh, using ground-based information, AI can now start to make predictions and provide very precise information that allows you to manage and improve yields. This is an area that has seen an explosive growth in its ability to actually create actionable insights and information and intelligence that can be applied in the real world. Space technology has grown leaps and bounds. Today, as I stand here, I can operate from Pakistan, from my office in Gulberg, satellites from any provider in the world, from 220 constellations that are in outer space. We can control them with our laptops. We can pinpoint those satellites to literally not even this university or this building or this auditorium, but the individual seats that you guys are sat on. We have the ability to do that now. And that access is more or less being democratized. I don't really have to do anything special. Uh, I don't even need to be a technical person to be able to do that. All I need to do is log into a platform, pay them the requisite amount of cash, and I can start to get access to some pretty sophisticated satellite data. Right? Remote sensing has come along a long, long, long way. AI coupled with remote sensing, it allows us not only to provide prescriptions and remedial prescriptions for things that have already happened and things that we are trying to fix, but actually what's super exciting is actually AI can help us predict when things are supposed to go wrong at very, very high precision levels. So we can massively de-risk at a national scale the impact of climate, anomalies, and actually start to control the amount and the yield of the crops that we're producing. So for me, at a top level, look, AI can help prescribe at a policy level how we can enhance yield in Pakistan. It has the ability to do that. But it doesn't stop there. Um, if you could please go to the next slide. So we're talking there about the sort of macro scale. Uh, however, as I mentioned, we now have access to technology that is a lot more sort of micro and precise than just a country level scale, right? There's AI models. You guys have probably heard of Facebook's or Meta's segment anything model. Well, you know, we have our own version of that, uh, which we use for crop identification in Pakistan. It can look at satellite imagery and actually draw fields automatically. Uh, you can separate all fields in Pakistan and digitalize all of Pakistan using AI in one go. Uh, what does that mean? That basically means at a crop level, you can start to track the type of crops that are growing in Pakistan. We have models that can do that with greater than 90% precision. They can tell you exactly what crop is growing where. Now, why is that important? Well, do you know what? You can tell whether you are growing enough of it or not. You can tell what the condition of it is, when, you know, when it's growing. When things go wrong, you're able to take corrective actions. You're using data and intelligence to drive your decision making. Similarly, uh, all of this information is available regularly. You can get daily revisit rates on imagery in Pakistan. So you can actually track a crop daily if that's what you wanted to do. You can track, track crops at night. You can track crops even when the weather's bad. There's advances like synthetic aperture radar mounted on satellites, which will penetrate clouds. Uh, they will even penetrate ground, and they'll go 30 centimeters under the ground. So you can start to actually even inspect plant rootstocks. You can start to inspect the amount of water under the ground. All this technology is available today. And uh, the really exciting thing is, actually, this technology is very difficult to synthesize. You can't do it in a spreadsheet. You can't do it in multiple spreadsheets. You need the power of AI to actually properly harness this technology. And I, that's one of the reasons that 
AI times agriculture, I think, is a super exciting space. I think it's very, very applicable to ag agriculture. And finally, I, it, it doesn't even stop there, right? Uh, the benefit of AI can actually apply to in individual farmers as well. And this is not something that is theoretical. I'm actually a farmer myself. And I've seen firsthand what AI can do. It helps me grow more. It helps me save water. It helps me reduce my reliance on inputs, like fertilizer and pesticide. It helps me reduce my reliance on fossil fuels, like diesel. I can use AI plus remote sensing to track the health of my crops. I can use it to identify the health of my soil and predict the future health of my soil. I can use it to identify the risk or probability of pests and diseases occurring on my farm at a very high level of precision. I can use it to see historically what the most productive areas of a particular farm have been, and I can actually work on the areas that are non-productive. I can do something about that. Uh, I can use it to tell me when and how much to irrigate, saving water. I can use it to tell me when and how much fertilizer to apply. So AI for a farmer can help the farmer at an individual plot level grow more for less with less effort. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to conclude. In my opinion, the situation uh, of food insecurity globally and in Pakistan is undeniable. It's really, really important, particularly for this audience, because you will be the most affected by it. Uh, if nothing is done about food insecurity and climate change, you guys will be living in a world of endless suffering. I'll probably be long gone by then. So we must change. We must change our approach, our mindset. We must leverage new technology. And we must use this new technology, and particularly AI, to increase food security in Pakistan and in time make the world a food secure world. Thank you.